Uh, thanks everybody for showing up today. I'm quite impressed. Full house almost. I feel quite honoured. Um, hormone replacement therapy. This topic has been of large interest to me, primarily because my area of research is cardiovascular physiology. I'm very interested in the cardiovascular effects of estrogen and estrogen deficiency. When we talk about estrogen deficiency, or when I talk about that, I'm referring most frequently to menopause. What I'd like to be able to do is sort of take you through a little bit of the HRT journey. This is quite a, but it's still a controversial topic, if you will. Do we or do we not give postmenopausal women HRT? And my answer to that is, well, it probably depends. And hopefully by the end of the talk today, if anything, I may have helped to clarify some of the controversy surrounding HRT, and perhaps at least sort of send you away with a sense of, okay, I think I'm a little bit better informed about what HRT is and what it does and what it doesn't do, and what are some of the risks associated with hormone replacement therapy. Um, so I didn't even introduce myself as an O'Donnell lecturer, exercise physiology, I apologize. But I'm going to, so I'm going to proceed through, and well, what I'd like to say to you is, as I'm going through this, if there's any aspect or something that you feel you have a question, I would encourage you to do it as we go along, perhaps. Um, if it proves too many questions are popping up all of the time, maybe we'll save them towards the end. I do aim to be finished in around 45 minutes. So um, hopefully that works well for you. Um, I certainly don't intend to keep here for too, too long. Um, but I do welcome questions. And if I'm not clear on something, please don't be shy about stopping me. I'll do my best. Oh, if I turn this off again now. So I'm looking at my colleague there because no, it's not green. I might just have to refer to this. Old school. Um, since I am talking about uh, a drug, I think it's important to, to iterate. I don't have any conflict of interest or any disclosures. I don't work for the drug companies or anything like that. I'm just here to share some research knowledge um, that I have learned in the process, um, and hopefully it will, as I say, help clarify some issues around HRT. I'm not going to spend too much time on the physiology of menopause or anything along those lines, because we just don't have the time to go into too much detail. And, and just as a point of interest, when I was putting this talk together, it became very apparent very quickly, I probably could have done a series of talks on this. I'm trying to condense an awful lot of information. Um, hopefully I've managed to extract the most salient points for you, but it is important just to identify. When we talk about menopause, what do we mean? In its most general terms, it's referring to the time when a woman's period stop and her ovaries lose their reproductive function. So cessation of menses, typically in terms of clinical definition, at least 12 months since the last menstrual uh, period. Typically, menopause will occur between the ages of 45 and 55 years of age, with about 80% of women being postmenopausal by the time they are 54. And in the UK and in the States, um, the average age is 51 years of age. So this slide from Menopause UK just sort of puts some numbers to it, if you, in terms of the scale. 13 million women in the UK are going through or have reached menopause. These are, these are 2015 stats, so you know, they're relatively up to date. Um, and that reflects or equates to approximately about one in three women in the female population going through menopause. Now about a quarter of these are going to sell through just fine, thank you very much. But about a quarter of these may present with very severe symptoms. I'm going to talk a little bit about those symptoms, but I'm not going to spend too much time on them again, because I really want to sort of get to the evidence about HRT and causes and effects of whether it's beneficial or not beneficial for postmenopausal <coughs> women. But sufficient to say, some women will really, really struggle with menopause in terms of the symptomology. I just extracted this off the internet. I'm sure a lot of Women may have already seen this, a lot of men also, I don't know, I don't mean to be sexist on this issue at all, um, but there are approximately 34 menopausal symptoms. Women could present with any number or any combination of these, or they may not. Every woman is different, I think that's important 
to remember. Um, the most common, the most commonly talked about, the most commonly reported are hot flashes and night sweats. So absolute violent hot flash, heat surges coming on, profuse sweating, cooling down, then feeling very, very cold, so like you can't win really. This may happen any number of times during the day. Obviously, if you have it a lot, it can be very disconcerting. Your work colleagues can see that you're perspiring profusely, clearly you're menopausal, going through that process, you may be flushed in the face. Um, you're probably not sleeping very well either. Um, so you can sort of see over a period of time, and unfortunately, menopause symptoms can last, I did put it in capitals, years. A very long time, anything from two to eight years typically, but there are reports of longer of up to 15 years. I mean, if you were symptomatic, that would probably be quite unbearable. So when we talk about menopause, we talked about estrogen deficiency, the loss of the reproductive function. We're losing estrogen. And I wanted to sort of just spend a few minutes with you to sort of talk about, okay, so what is it about estrogen? I don't want to talk about the reproductive um, functions of estrogen. That aside, if we focus a minute and think, okay, let's have a look at the brain. Estrogen receptors are located throughout the body, including the brain. Wherever we find a receptor, what that means is there's a role for estrogen. There's lots of them in the brain. So we know that estrogen plays a role in body thermoregulation, body temperature. It's not uncommon for postmenopausal women to complain of feeling cold all the time, in between raging hot bursts of heat. It's quite unpleasant. Uh, memory function. A lot of postmenopausal women will complain of uh, memory recall issues, forgetfulness, brain fog. Um, if we go over to the liver, cholesterol production and regulation, what does that mean? Estrogen plays an important role in cholesterol metabolism. So we know that in the premenopausal state, when we have naturally occurring levels of estrogen cycling across the menstrual cycle, that has a favorable effect on our cholesterol regulation. So we have a favorable lipid profile. We want high, good cholesterol, low, bad cholesterol. And that's what estrogen elicits, those sort of favorable cholesterol effects. And in the heart, it's protecting from cholesterol. And what that means is it's protecting the deposition of that cholesterol in those little arteries, the coronary arteries. So it's having a favorable effect on what we call atherogenesis, the development of heart disease. So in some ways, estrogen is being cardioprotective and it's almost attenuating, slowing down the development of heart disease. So when women go through menopause, there's a dramatic drop in estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen and progesterone are the two main ovarian hormones, the sex down hormones. Characteristically, what we see is cessation of menses, and as I was saying, estrogen deficiency, and these are linked to the menopausal symptoms that I was describing previously. And probably got most evidence surrounding the effect of estrogen deficiency on bone health, namely osteoporosis. We do see a very marked acceleration uh, in the development of impairments in bone health, bone health in postmenopausal women in association with their estrogen deficiency. But we also see an acceleration of cardiovascular disease risk. And we think, in part, that is also associated with the loss of those beneficial effects of estrogen on the lipid profile and on the blood vessels. And I'll talk a little bit, <coughs> little bit more about that. But as the cardiovascular physiologist, I'm really going to focus on cardiovascular disease throughout the rest of this talk. It's just beyond the scope. I can't go into all the other aspects, unfortunately. Um, and what we do know is estrogen therapy, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the evidence that we've got, but overall, we know that HRT, or estrogen replacement, can be quite beneficial for menopausal symptoms for a lot of women. Not all of them, but for a lot of them. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Um, estrogen therapy improves bone health for most women. Cardiovascular health, well, it depends on where you're sitting on the fence and what you're looking at. There are goods, and it would appear that there are bad. And that's sort of what I want to sort of spend a little bit of time on in terms of HRT and what those good and those bad effects are. So 
So if we talk about heart disease, and we talk about the beneficial effects of estrogen, what kind of evidence do we have that would suggest that estrogen is cardioprotective? And this, this slide alludes to the percentage of deaths due to cardiovascular disease, men versus women. Now, I apologize, it's quite an old slide. This is from 1999. But I wanted to go back to that era because really the issues surrounding HRT were being built on evidence at that time, what we had and what we knew. So I could give you current data, but it doesn't relate to why decisions about HRT being administered to prevent heart disease was going ahead. So what we knew at this time, in and around here, what we see is cardiovascular disease risk, We've got the blue bars for the men, we've got the pink bars for the women, we've got age stratification along on the x-axis, this is just percentage of deaths. So what we see, sort of trajectory-wise, if you look for men and women, it's increasing with age. We already knew that, but what we see is, if we look at the trajectories, they do differ between men and women. So what we see with men is just a steady increase in cardiovascular disease with age. With women, less so. We have less risk during the premenopausal years, in those estrogen replete years, during those re reproductive years. And then menopause comes along, around, let's say it's 51 in there somewhere, and then we have this sort of gradual, slow catch-up. Atherosclerosis, heart disease, cardiovascular disease takes decades to evolve and develop. It's not something you would expect to see overnight. It takes a bit of time. And we can see sort of decade over decade, we see the pink bars catching up with the blue bars and going past the blue bars. And this is what we sort of still see today. That cardiovascular disease risk is accelerated during the postmenopausal years. And we still think today that is in association in part with the adverse effects of estrogen deficiency on the lipid profile. So you take estrogen away, we're increasing cholesterol levels, we're getting increased deposition in the coronary arteries, we're accelerating heart disease. Other evidence that we have is if we look to studies reporting cardiovascular disease risk and the effects of early menopause. So without getting too lost in the details here, so early menopause, I'm talking to women that would naturally go through this process um, earlier than 50. So 45 to 50 typically we would call early. If you're around 40 years of age, it's premature. But this is early. And what we tend to see with women that present with uh, natural menopause, or if you compare women who have menopause, I'm sorry, less than 50 years of age, and compare them to women who went through menopause naturally at 51, well, there's a relative risk increase. And what this is sort of suggesting is that those early menopausal women are about 27% more likely to develop uh, cardiovascular disease compared to your naturally menopausal women as they progress with age. Ovophorectomy. This is what we call surgical menopause, if you will. We remove the ovaries, typically for prophylactic reasons, typically for cancer reasons. Take them out because they need to come out we take the ovaries out, we have removed the dominant source of estrogen in the woman's body. So she could be 35, 40 years old, taking out the ovaries, boom, no estrogen. She's straight away menopausal. Those estrogen levels are flat down here somewhere. And what we see is a very marked increased risk of cardiovascular disease. It's about four and a half times greater. And if you go younger than 50, if you go down to 40, that risk really goes quite high, around 17 to 20 times higher. And again, these mechanisms of accelerated cardiovascular disease in association with the removal of estrogen or going through an early menopause um, is associated with this development of a what we call a pro-atherogenic profile, an increase in those bad levels of cholesterol and a decrease of those good levels of cholesterol. And just in general, we know that premenopausal women have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease than age match men, which that chart showed you earlier. And we know that in postmenopausal women, estrogen deficiency impairs blood vessel function. 
that seems a, probably a bit, a bit innocuous to say, well, so what? Well, the blood vessels are really, really important as a component of the cardiovascular system. If they're not functioning well, um, there's a good chance that the heart's having to work quite a bit harder. Um, and again, we see increases in these cholesterol levels, as I've mentioned a few times. And estrogen therapy has been demonstrated to improve the lipid profile, to improve vascular function. In fact, if we look at cohort studies, observational studies, there's evidence that supports quite consistency. There's a significant decrease in cardiovascular disease risk if we give estrogen therapy to postmenopausal women. But there are caveats to this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those caveats. And there are discrepancies between what we have learned from observational studies and experimental studies versus what we call randomized clinical trials, the gold standard of assessment. If we want to look at the effect of an intervention, if we, if we want to be relatively confident about our results, we need to conduct a randomized clinical trial. But there's an overwhelming amount of observational studies that do support a beneficial effect of estrogen replacement therapy on cardiovascular disease risk in postmenopausal women. Similarly, a lot of animal data also support these findings. So when we think about it, this is sort of back in the 90s really, early 90s, late 80s, but well, we've got a lot of consistent evidence here that estrogen seems to be cardioprotective. It seems to be having a beneficial effect on the heart. Um, it seems really, really logical Worry. It seems really logical to then say, okay, well, if it's so beneficial, so let's just give some estrogen back to these women and let's prevent heart disease. So let's not think about just menopausal symptom management. Let's take it to the next level and say, let's see if we can't demonstrate that hormone therapy can prevent heart disease. Wouldn't that be amazing? So a number of clinical trials were put together, and the ones I'm presenting today are the key ones. A couple of studies, so there's a couple I'm going to present. One is going to look at the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And when I talk about secondary prevention, what this group are interested in are if I give estrogen therapy to women who already have heart disease, can I prevent a secondary event potentially? In primary prevention, I'm talking about women who are presenting with no cardiovascular disease, otherwise healthy. If I give them hormone replacement therapy, can I prevent atherosclerosis altogether or slow it down? This is one of the early ones. This is called the HERD study. So it's a randomized trial. I didn't want to put too much detail on here, but it should be sufficient just to give you an idea. Number one, what their primary outcome variables were. So they were interested in it. They were looking at the secondary prevention of a heart attack, an MI, or coronary heart disease. So that's the atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries. They had around 2,700 women split into a group that received hormone replacement therapy and a group that did not. So relatively equally divided. I'm not going to get too tangled up in this therapy itself. I've got a few slides that talks to what that therapy is. But for now, consider it replacement of hormones, no replacement of hormones. Two separate groups. You can see the age of the women they're around 67 years of age. The cohort was ranging from 44 to 79 years of age. And these women, because it's a secondary prevention trial, these women already have established coronary artery disease. And one thing you should be noting at this point is the age of these participants. And I've, I've got a few slides that will underscore why that's important, but I wanted to point it out here. Primary outcome variables, so non-fatal heart attack or death due to coronary artery disease or heart disease. And there were a number of secondary outcomes and they've got, um, there's cancer in here and blood clots. These are other important parameters, but they were not the primary outcome variables. But as due 
uh, diligence, they have to follow these, these risks. But this treatment? These are the results. Year one. The results demonstrated there was an excess risk, they called it excess risk, of a heart attack in the HRT versus placebo, but it was not enough to stop the study. The study continued for four years. This excess risk of heart attack with hormone replacement therapy, it decreased over time such that the groups were the same. Okay. But there was an increased risk of, you have to forgive me, I put VTE, that's a blood clot. Okay. So increased risk of a blood clot versus the placebo. No difference in the primary or secondary outcome variables between the groups. So the overall consensus or the, the finding from that study that was concluded is that there's a null finding for the secondary prevention of a heart attack or coronary artery disease death with HRT. So it's, it would really suggest, well, there's no benefit, so what's the point? Then along came the Women's Health, in Health Initiative. They had a couple of trials. What they wanted to look at, okay, um, let's do a bigger study, and let's look at primary prevention. So in women that are healthy, that do not have established heart disease, if we give them some hormone replacement, is that to their be benefit in terms of health, in terms of cardiovascular health? Let's have a look at that. And they were also curious to say, well, what about if we just gave them the estrogen therapy and we didn't give them what we call opposed therapy? So standard practice in a menopausal woman, if you are menopausal and you have a uterus, your womb is still intact, you have to have estrogen plus progesterone. Progesterone is very important. Progesterone will elicit changes in the uterus that in response to having the estrogen will elicit a bleed, a withdrawal. Because during the estrogen alone phase, you're going to get what we call a build-up in that endometrium, that lush lining starts to develop. It's important that that is shed. If we don't give progesterone, if we don't oppose, we increase the risk of endometrial cancer. And that's why it's important that you oppose. In women that have a hysterectomy, and a lot of women have them, in hysterectomized women, they don't have a uterus. They can just go estrogen alone. So despite the groups being somewhat different, i.e. uterus, no uterus, they wanted to have a look and just see if there might be differences between the hormone regimen. Because the previous study findings suggest there's no benefit of HRT. And with all that observational data suggesting a beneficial effect of estrogen, this is the estrogen alone study. So they're, they're probably anticipating you might see something beneficial here but maybe not here. So they ran these two studies. This is the hormone, which is opposed, so the estrogen and the progesterone therapy versus the placebo. They've got good size numbers here. Uh, mean age, 63. Again, women recruited between the ages of 50 and 79. Healthy, with no known coronary artery <coughs> disease. Similar primary outcome variables as the previous studies coronary artery disease, a stroke, a blood clot, breast cancer risk. That was brought to the fore because the previous study was suggesting there may be augmented risk of breast cancer with hormone therapy, so it was important to look at that. And they also came up with what they called a global health index, which is just a composite of scores. So if they put everything in there, in terms of cause of death overall, did you die or did you not? Yeah. These are the results. This study was stopped after about five and a half years. But in the first two years, and I'll get to the reason why in a moment, in the first two years of the study, there was an increased risk of heart disease uh, with hormone replacement therapy. And the risk seemed to be greater in women who were more than 10 years versus less than 10 years post-menopause, suggesting there might be a benefit maybe for women nearer to menopause versus not. But it wasn't clear in this study. It was the increased risk of heart disease and breast cancer that stopped this study. Overall, these study authors concluded there's a negative finding, so there's adverse findings, not good, um, in terms of heart disease and breast cancer risk. 
The concluding statements from the authors for this study, the risks of treatment are outweighed or they outweigh the benefits during this course of treatments over the, the five and a half years that we ran the study. Estrogen plus progestin therapy should not be initiated or continued for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Importantly, just to iterate, these studies that are being run, they're, they're, they're purely to observe the cardiovascular effects. They're not interested in, they are not assessing whether these therapies are efficacious for menopausal symptoms. And they're not stratifying by age, looking at menopausal symptoms or anything like that. And it's an important component, but I'll come back to that. Clinical consequences. If you can believe it, from that study, clinical practice was changed. This is when HRT came, went from being the most popularly described, I can't think of a better word right now, but it was a very well-prescribed drug to <laughs> pendulum just went right the other way, that's it. HRT went right out of favor. So clinicians and patients were quite confused because they weren't sure about the health risks associated with HRT. What were these studies saying? So clinicians took women off HRT, so had patients who were using it, so that's it, no more for you. And they stopped prescribing HRT to new symptomatic patients. So, and on the other side, you had the patients who were very scared, thinking, well, should I be taking this? I mean, it might kill me, right? So, yes. Was that just the estrogen and progesterone together? That? Yes. It wasn't just done with estrogen only as well? These are the results, exactly. So from the estrogen plus progesterone, this is what came out of this. Practice right. was changed because most women are on the combined therapy. So therapy, the, the whole practice was changed based on these findings. So a very dramatic effect, very dramatic. This is the subsequent study. They were, they were running in tandem. It just took longer to recruit some participants for the hysterectomized version of the study, if you will, looking at the effect of just estrogen alone and no estrogen therapy. Again, when 64 years of age, Women aged 50 to 79 years of age, um, no known coronary artery disease. In terms of outcome variables, they're the same as the previous study. What did they find? This study was stopped after seven years. And we'll come to why in a moment. So within two years of starting the study, again, we saw an increased risk of coronary heart disease with the estrogen replacement therapy. If we went the full duration before they stopped the study, there was no effect on heart disease. It didn't improve it, it didn't make it worse. There was a higher risk of stroke though. And that was the main reason that they stopped that study. They did demonstrate decreased breast cancer risk and hip fracture risk, but because of the risk of stroke, the study was stopped. And overall, this is a null finding for the primary, for the primary prevention of coronary heart disease with estrogen replacement therapy. From a cardiovascular perspective, it's saying well, there's no benefit. So if there's an increased risk of stroke, let's not go. So for this study, the authors concluded that women considering estrogen alone as a therapy, they should be cancelled about an increased risk of stroke, but can be reassured that there's no excess risk of heart disease or breast cancer. So there are some silver linings from these studies, not many, <laughs> but it's a learning process, so that's, that's always good, right, understanding it better. So <coughs> HRT with CEE plus NPA, so that's the combined therapy for five and a half years, or estrogen alone for seven years in healthy women without cardiovascular disease, is not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease or cancer mortality when they were followed up for another about 10 years. So what it's saying is that in the WHI study, there was no difference in death rates between women who had taken the hormone therapy and those who had not, no matter which therapy it was, after a 10-year follow-up. So at least we know that in terms of, it didn't matter what therapy they had, but if they were at increased risk or not increased risk, the follow-up demonstrated there's no differences in death rates in the two groups with follow-up when they're not taking any more therapy about 10 years after therapy cessation. Small, you know, small victories, small victories for those women. 
But there are some considerations to take into account with these studies. Um, yes, they are randomized controlled clinical trials. Yes, they do have very large numbers. Um, the findings were questioned. Why are these findings in such stark contrast to what we already believed or saw or knew about the cardiovascular beneficial effect of estrogen? What's, what's going on here? Is it something to do with the HRT regimen, or could age be having an impact? If you think about menopause, remember I said that the age of menopause is around 51 on average, and this would typically be around the age that women would, might be seeking HRT for menopause or symptom relief. It would be very unusual to be up to the years of 79, 64, 67, as they were in this study, to go in for those reasons, for those purposes. So a lot of subsequent reanalyses and commentary came out of these studies, saying, okay, well, we should look at this really. Let's look at it a little bit closer. So yes, the age was pretty high in terms of age past menopause. These women would have either subclinical, so i.e. not necessarily overt, furred up arteries, if you will, but they'll have something there. Um, or established heart disease, as with the um, her study, where they actually recruited women with heart disease. They already have some level of heart disease. And we already know that with increasing age, you're going to see increased risks for cancer, bone uh, impairments, and cardiovascular disease. There are a number of other shortcomings from the studies, but I just don't have the time to go into them. When we think about the observational studies that were very supportive of the cardiovascular benefits of oestrogen, these women were typically recruited in and around menopause, recruited for menopausal relief symptoms or, or, or relief of their symptoms. So they're younger, they're healthier, and absence of cardiovascular disease at that time is going to be far more likely compared to a woman who's in her 60s. So questions came to, so might HRT be given to young, healthy menopausal women? For, for beneficial cardiovascular disease prevention. Are we looking at this the wrong way? Instead of clumping 50 to 79 year olds all together in one, I mean, bearing in mind 79 is a study entry, then you follow them for another seven years, they're into their 80s now. Um, what, what if we just came down the scale a bit and started looking at different ages? Maybe younger women might benefit, maybe. And conversely, you know, with older menopausal women who most likely already have some subclinical, if not overt, heart disease. Maybe that produces or you know, yields very different results with hormone therapy. Maybe we should be separating this out and having a look at that. And around this time, sort of the 2000s, a lot of primate work was going on trying to sort of say, okay, let's have a little look at these uh, cardiovascular effects of estrogen and estrogen deficiency. And in non human primates, the monkeys, you might think, oh, that's great, isn't it? But uh, monkeys actually are a very good model uh, for examining um, disease states, um, particularly cardiovascular disease, particularly in females, because the whole reproductive axis is exactly the same and operates the same as it does in women, in humans. So it's a very common model to look at cardiovascular disease risk in, in the female populace. Uh, in non-human primates, if we just take out the ovaries, we see accelerated heart disease. If we give them 17 beta estradiol, now that estrogen is, is found in the human body. This is the dominant female premenopausal estrogen. And this is the estrogen that is associated with the greatest cardiovascular benefit. So they're not getting this CEE, and I'll tell you what that is in a moment. They're getting this 17 beta estradiol, and it reduced the risk of atherosclerosis development by about 50 to 70 percent. And what they noted is if they gave hormone therapy to these um, ovarianized animals two years, which is the equivalent of about <coughs> six years in humans, estrogen therapy didn't confer any benefit, i.e. atherosclerosis just continued to develop anyway. So it's like, hmm, if heart disease is already present, perhaps estrogen can't reverse this process or it doesn't help. So based on that, a window of opportunity was thought, maybe 
there's a timing issue here, and this timing hypothesis evolved. What this hypothesis proposed is that women that are very uh, close to menopause, going through menopause, they probably have a little bit of a subclinical deposition, but nothing overt. It's not, you probably couldn't even detect it. But we know estrogen elicits very favorable effects on the blood vessels in women. Estrogen is very important in the vasculature in women, and it helps with vessel integrity, regulation, tone, all of these things. That's very important for blood pressure and heart uh, function. So the importance of estrogen during those early years has been well recognized. So what was then proposed, perhaps, was, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, if you had established heart disease, like the older women probably would, there would be what they called an altered biology of estrogen. There wouldn't be this beneficial effect. In fact, there might actually be the opposite, adverse effect, causing the vessel to constrict, not respond favorably. There was some reanalysis of the WHI data. So this is the estrogen plus the progesterone, the combined therapy. So, okay, let's have a look at that. Let's look at the 50 to 59 year olds, 60 to 69, the 70 to 79 year olds. What we have is the number of events versus placebo. So if you're on the hormone therapy, this is the number of events versus placebo per 10,000 women per year. This is typically how we present these data so we compare groups. So in the 50 to 59 year old, so I need to orientate you, I'm sorry. So we've got heart disease. Um, I apologize, it's all in gray, it's not terribly, terribly helpful. Um, but in the same order, you've got heart disease. Testing, 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 this is the additional risk. The five more women are presenting with CHD versus placebo. So on and so forth on each group. And these data also suggest that in younger postmenopause women, HRT does not confer a cardiovascular benefit. It doesn't seem to. It may actually increase to increase the risk of the blood clots. Bearing in mind, if we use the World Health Organization for what we call rare risk, a lot of drugs will describe it as rare or not rare. If it's rare, it's less than 10 in 10,000. So a lot of these here are rare, unusual, but still they're there. So what about if we just look to the estrogen only group? Same groupings in terms of age group, same outcome parameters here at the top. What is quite apparent, we still see with increasing age and the increasing risk of stroke um, and other disease states, but interestingly, in this younger group, ERT does not increase the risk of stroke and it appears to lower the risk for coronary heart, uh, heart disease and breast cancer. That was quite unexpected on some level, but it's sort of supports in, in a way a lot of the evidence that was presented by the observational and the cohort and the experimental studies that were done years before. So it supports that in part. Differences to note in younger postmenopausal women. So despite neither of these studies, it's quite important to remember they're not designed to answer this question about age and HRT if there's an interaction it's subsequent, let's go back and have a look at the data afterwards. And it's great that they were able to demonstrate these findings, but these studies weren't actually designed to answer these questions. Um, so it, be it became apparent that CEE, so the combined therapy, may confer adverse effects. Estrogen alone may confer beneficial effects. It's all quite non-committal, but they have to be careful with this. So why the difference? Why might there be a difference between if you have a combined therapy versus estrogen alone therapy? Why might there be benefit in one group and less so in another? 
Again, is the HRT regimen important? These studies, the WHI and the HERS, they both use standard regimen at that time, which is it's an oral preparation, so it's a tablet, and if you had your, your womb, your uterus, as I was saying, you need to have a post therapy. <coughs> they had CEE, <coughs> which is conjugated equine estrogen, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. And they had medroxyprogesterone acetate. If you had a hysterectomy, you just had the estrogen alone. And you're probably sitting there like, well, what are these things then? What are these substances? So as the name might suggest, conjugated equine into estrogen is derived from pregnant mare's urine. So the brand name, Premarin, still used today, um, it's comprised of about 10 different estrogens. Uh, very um, few of them, of which are found in the human body, about seven are specific to, to horses, but they all collectively, these hormones do exert very potent what we call estrogenic effects. And they mimic that of the estrogen made in the female body during those premenopausal years. And with the NPA, it's just a synthetic progesterone. So, and it, it mimics the effects of the progesterone in the human body. Um, some evidence would suggest there are some concerns about the different types of progesterones, um, but I've got time to go into that too much, I'm afraid. But in the endometrium, it's important, it does have an opposing effect on estrogen, which you want, because you want the endometrium to, to move to what we call the secretory phase to elicit the withdrawal. Bone. Newer generation of progesterones are available now, and I, I, I put that in, and I probably shouldn't have, because it's probably more confusing than anything else, but progesterone does physiologically have some opposing effects to estrogen, so beyond the endometrium, also in the blood vessels. So if estrogen causes the vessels to dilate, progesterone can cause the vessels to constrict. And it was postulated for a while that maybe by giving this, these two sort of competing factors, if you will, when we're looking at cardiovascular health, that might be important. Um, but today, we've moved on to new generations of progestins anyway, where we don't see quite such antagonistic effects anyway. So beyond the HRT regimen and beyond the age effects, the other thing that came to light, and it was postulated, I thought, okay, we've looked at age, 50 to 59, etc. What if we look at time since menopause? Yes, the average age is 51, but some are going to get there at 45, some might get there at 55. In this grouping, if you think of a 50 to 59 year old window, some women could be almost 15 years since menopause at study entry. That's long enough to be estrogen deficient to have potentially developed some level of suffering coarthrocerosis. Um, so the differences in the cardiovascular outcomes may be accounted for more accurately by time since menopause. Studies to answer these questions? There are a number of ongoing studies, but this study, the Danish Osteoporosis Prevention Study, started back in 1990s, and they had just quite inadvertently recruited lots of women for, to look at the effects of HRT on osteoporosis, but in that process, they were also interested in some of the cardiovascular outcomes. And they looked at these events and, the, and bone health initially in recently menopausal women. These women were about three to 24 months since their last menstrual bleed. So they're relatively new, if you will, to the menopause era. Um, so they're young, healthy women split into two groups, receiving some therapy, so the hormone therapy, not therapy, looking at primary outcome measures, death or admission for heart failure or heart attack. Unfortunately, this study stopped after 10 years because of the WHI results. Um, they were required to stop. Um, but women receiving HRT, this is what they found with their 10 years worth of data that they did get, um, these women had significantly reduced risk of mortality, heart failure, heart attack, without any apparent increased risk in cancer or blood clot or stroke. Quite remarkable, really. There didn't seem to be any um, adverse effects at all in this, in this particular group. 
these are just some of the numbers in terms of the composite groups, the number of women who had uh, reached a primary end point, so 33 in the control group versus 15 um, and, uh, and 15 and died compared to 26. Sorry, I confused myself with that one there. 16 women in the treatment group experienced the primary composite end point compared with 33 in the con control group and 15. So 33 versus 15, suggesting there was like, oh, there seems to be a benefit of being on the estrogen replacement. Um, and just to iterate, this is a completely different regimen, and I don't have time to talk about this, but they were given 17 beta estradiol, so not that conjugated estrogen from the mare's urine. They didn't use that one. They used 17 beta estradiol. And this might be really, really important. This might be why they're seeing better or more favorable effects. Studies still are going, obviously, to further studies are looking into this. And this is another study that is currently ongoing, so the early versus late intervention with estradiol. Other studies are, okay, we should look into this. Maybe the regimen's really important. So they're looking at uh, postmenopausal, we're divided into estrogen therapy, and that either comprised 17 beta estradiol alone, if they were hysterectomized. If they weren't, they also received a micronized progesterone, so it's a totally different type of progesterone versus no treatment. And these women were separated into less than six years or more than 10 years since menopause. We don't have the results from this one yet. So it'll be interesting to see what comes from here. So I'm just about to wrap it up now, and I apologize if I've run through at a rate of knots. Um, so how do we make sense of that? I think that's a really good question. Um, I tried to distill it down and maybe sort of say, OK, if you can take anything home, let's think about this. HRT for prevention of chronic diseases is not advocated or indicated. We do not give HRT for the prevention of heart disease or any other disease. So you would not be prescribed it for that purpose. The Women's Health Initiative and the HERS study, they were not designed to address the efficacy of HRT for menopausal symptoms. Now that's important because if you think about clinical practice, it was changed based on findings relating to cardiovascular disease risk. And in the WHI and the HERS studies, the duration of treatment was intended to be very long because they're looking for clinical endpoints, death, or an event. When you present to the doctors and ask for menopausal or, or, or help with your coping with your menopausal symptoms and you get prescribed HRT, it's going to be quite a short window. It may be as short as a year, maybe even be up to five years, but it's not going to be anything in the region of what these studies were designed to do in looking for clinical endpoints. That's an important thing to sort of you know, keep a perspective on this. And I should iterate, chronic disease prevention is not all about estrogen. I've talked a lot about estrogen today and its wonders of cardiovascular benefits, potentially or potentially adverse effects, depending on how it's administered. Not all about estrogen all the time, obviously there are lifestyle factors, SES factors, like socioeconomic status factors, environmental factors. I, I just didn't have time to go into any of those. But it's just it, just to sort of put it all into perspective. The general clinical consensus is such that for women in early menopause and without contraindications to treatments, the benefits of HRT are likely to outweigh the risks when used for menopausal symptom management. In the UK, we've got the um, National Collaborating Centre for Women's and Children's Health UK. Um, this group are like quality standard for professional healthcare, uh, healthcare professionals, sorry, and they advocate um, policy and procedure. And with regard to hormone therapy, this group say that menopausal women and their healthcare professionals should understand that HRT does not increase cardiovascular disease risk when started in women aged under 60 years of age and does not affect the risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. Also, the presence of cardiovascular risk factors is not a contraindication uh, to HRT as long as they are optimally managed. And that's current consensus here in the UK in terms of practice. Recommendations? Before anyone says, what would you do? Would you take it? If you are symptomatic and you feel that you're not coping with that, you think HRT might actually help me, even if it's just for a year or six months, whatever, to get me through this hellish time, talk to your GP. I have gone on far too long, I apologise. Any questions? Thank you for your time.